Greg, I'm going to, I'm going to make the assumption here that we're going to, we're going to call in the lefty here. We're going to call in the, the reliever, Rick Vaughn, Greg, Greg yeah. Cohen, because we are live on Facebook for the Tuesday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez, my co-host, the all-star reliever pitcher, the Rick Vaughn of rental property investing, the wild thing. Greg Cohen. <laughs> there we go. That's your best intro yet, buddy. I like that one. That <laughs> I need the mohawk. I need the glasses, yeah. man. Yeah, Let's bring Major gotta... League back. <laughs> the wild thing, Greg Cohen. I love it, man. <laughs> right. We normally have a little bit of housekeeping here for, for the new uh, attendees and for our regulars. Welcome back, right? You know the deal. This is an interactive show. We want you asking questions. Um, the first part of it is going to be heavily driven with our conversation with us and, and, and John Payton, but we want you participating. And the best way to do it is to either use that chat screen and hit that blue button that says all panelists and drop that down to all panelists atten attendees so y'all can speak with each other. Or if you want a question asked here on the show, the best thing to do is to pop open that Q&A button on the bottom right and put your question in there because I got a lot of things going on that I got to moderate and keep track of. My eyes will go cross-eyed if I'm looking everywhere, but I'll do my best and try to get it answered. And last but not least, if you want a breakdown on all things rental property investing um, and you want the free investor toolkit that JWB gives out, which includes the spreadsheet that estimates your ROI that we mess around with on Thursdays, it's actually becoming uh, one of my favorite parts of my day on Thursdays, if not my week. It's a lot of fun. Go to JWB webclass.com. And without further ado, I want to introduce a lifelong Jacksonville native, president of one of the biggest privately owned corporations in Florida, the Gate Petroleum Company, a billion dollar corporation, former two-term Jacksonville mayor, uh, former chair or current chair of the Jack's Chamber of Commerce? Former, former. Former, 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 former chair. Yeah, former. Yeah. I know it was recent of the Jack's Chamber of Commerce and really one of the great leaders of our community and somebody that Greg and I are incredibly excited to have on. We can't possibly convey all the great things that he has done. John Payton, welcome, John. How are you Thanks, today? Pablo. It's good to be with you. Sorry about the uh, technology glitch there. You know, John, I mean, you've led our city through the Great Recession. You led us to all these challenges. But where do the technical challenges rank on your list of accomplishments? <laughs> I tell you, you know, I am, uh, I am technologically challenged. Uh, but this was uh, this I really was thrown for a loop this morning. But anyway, we're back online. And, uh, you know, we're actually in the hospitality business. And we have these ongoing debates about, you know, will the convention center business come back? Uh, conferences and groups. And I will tell you, after this experience, I think there'll be so much Zoom fatigue and uh, Google fatigue and uh, go-to meeting fatigue that um, I'm hoping that business comes back uh, roaring uh, like it did after 9-11 and after it did the Great Recession. So well, it's good to be with you guys. It's good to have Likewise. you. And, and, and I couldn't agree more, right? Like I, I myself, I'm craving for human connection, right? There's this like right. clip of um, Chris Farley that is like playing a talk show host. He's running up and down the aisles, hugging people frantically. <laughs> and I feel like, I feel like that's what's right. going to happen when all this thing, when all this thing, um, changes again right but right but john, let's hope but, so yeah for sure and listen we we kind of wanted to start john with you 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 are you were born here right like you are you're a jacksonville I was. native I was. You, grew up, you grew up watching your father build this behemoth corporation went into the family business ascended through it can you just give us a little bit of a little bit of context and history of what it was like growing up here and 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 going into the family business and just give us a little bit of an origin story well, you know, I've, I've watched Jacksonville really uh, most of my life, and I've been around this town. Of course, I left for school, and I worked in D.C. for a while, and um, and so uh, I've, I've been able to kind of watch it uh, uh, evolve. And it's been uh, it's been quite a quite an experience. I I, um, I I love this area. Obviously, I'm a little partial to it, and enough to where I ran for mayor after after having no political experience for the most part. Uh, and, uh, and, and really am, am very bullish on, on where we're headed and, and where we've come from. Um, this, this part of the state is, you know, it hasn't experienced the level of growth that a lot of the places in Florida have. I mean, you look South Florida, Orlando, Tampa, even Miami, um, you've had areas just overrun with growth. Jacksonville's growth has been very measured over time. And, and I think that has afforded us uh, some great uh, luxuries of, of managed growth. Um, if you look at our our lifestyle here and our transportation system and our infrastructure, we've done a great job uh, staying ahead of it. You know, we've got a million people in this region now. Um, and, you know, a traffic jam is maybe tapping your brakes 
uh, as opposed to other areas where you have a million people, you'd, you'd have serious, you know, log jam and, and bottom-line traffic. So I think there, there, there are a lot of inherent benefits to this area that um, people really don't appreciate until they move here uh, because Jacksonville is largely unknown. That's been my experience. So when we hosted the Super Bowl in 2005, uh, it was amazing how many people didn't even know Jacksonville was in Florida, let alone that it was on the Atlantic Ocean um, and the great quality of life that we enjoy here. Uh, not to mention, um, we're the youngest city in Florida. Um, we have an economy that is uh, highly diversified and strong. Uh, it's not based on retirement. It's not based on tourism. Uh, huge healthcare sector here, big financial service sector here. And we have a strong military presence, which, which actually is a nice stabilizer, particularly during recessions, because it's virtually a recession-proof business. So there are a lot of inherent advantages to this area. Obviously, I'm a little biased. But born here, I've been mayor of the city. Um, we run our business here. We headquarter here. Um, uh, but there, there's a lot to it, and, and, and I love talking about it. Love it. Listen, you hit on you hit on some points that I, as somebody who moved here from South Florida a little bit over two years ago, it is so glaringly obvious to me, right? Like uh -huh. from from the idea that every time my wife and I get stopped at a red light, we look at each other, we go, Jacksonville traffic, am I right? <laughs> right? Like, it's, right, it's all relative. It's all super relative. The right. quality of life is spectacular. You you know, you mentioned sustainable growth. And I wanna and I wanna hit on that in your in Gate Petroleum, at a certain point, you grew as a gas corporation and you began to diversify. And, and now you have all these different branches from precast and hospitality and all these different things. But there was a moment, it seems like that, that you made a decision to go into the real estate market and, yeah. and, and start developing these resorts and this, and this hospitality. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, Gate really began diversifying in the 70s during the um, oil crisis. Um, you know, there was an oil embargo and high interest rates. It's a bad time. Um, and we start spreading out. We moved into construction materials, um, and we also moved into real estate development. So a lot of the uh, premier office parks in this community have been developed by Gabe Trollium. That includes Deerwood Center, South Point Office Park, uh, Deerwood Park. Um, those are major job hubs for those people who are not familiar with this area. That's a lot of where the growth has occurred in the office complexes to the south of town, between really the city and the beach. Uh, so we've been we've been successful here um, developing land, and now we're working on another project in St. John's County, just to the south of us, which is primarily retail. Uh, so uh, the, the the real estate market here has been very steady and, and very strong, um, but very measured. Uh, it hasn't been explosive, and I think that's that's a huge huge advantage in that ha we have been able to keep up with the growth. The other thing I would say too is we live better here, as you know, as you if you've, you've experienced as someone who's moved here. Very few folks recognize we have the largest park system in the United States of America in Duval County. Uh, the active parks and passive parks, we've just set aside a lot of land as really a growth management strategy. Uh, look, you don't have to provide the infrastructure and the roads and the, and the schools and the fire stations and uh, if you have you know, passive parks. So we have thousands and thousands of acres and you combine that with the, the miles and miles of waterway, both the Atlantic Ocean we have some of the finest beaches, I think, on the East Coast, and then you combine the St. John's River. So you just, we live better here. But there's another structural advantage that I think that, 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 is, that is not well known, um, I, and I think that enables this region to grow smartly. We have a very different form of government in, in Duval County than most places in the country, and that our city and county is actually consolidated. Uh, that affords us the ability um, to really move behind one vision uh, and implement and execute on vision uh, the mayor um, is a strong mayor form of government. The mayor's office has a lot of power here. Everyone in the government works for the mayor. Um, the mayor really serves as the CEO. Um, we don't have the typical inter-county uh, uh, conflicts, uh, inter-government agency conflicts. Uh, you've got a county that's 800 square miles uh, with one person in charge. So when we're looking at an economic opportunity, um, particularly recruiting businesses here, uh, we speak with one voice and, and we're able to move mountains uh, because of the way we're structured. And I think uh, one of the dividends of having a consolidated government is that um, our tax base is, is, is very competitive. We have one of the lowest tax burdens of any city in America. You already have Florida that has no uh, income tax, but then you, you put on top of that, the fact that we've got um, very low ad valorem taxes, which is really, uh, that's uh, our property tax rate, um, very low fees, so we have a lot of um, uh, tax advantages that make us a very, very attractive region in the way that we govern ourselves. So, so you know, I, I, would, I would say that for anyone who's looking to relocate or to build a business here, that's really, that's really important.
You, you bring up a great point, John. And a lot of our audience here is either rental property owners or soon to be rental property owners. And we we're talking about producing cash flow. Property taxes make a big deal. I never thought about <clears throat> the relationship between consolidated government and basically a lack of redundancy of offices. Right. Uh, really kind of limiting the overhead. So that's, that's really incredible. And, you know, the consolidated government for me was such an interesting thing as I looked a little bit more into it as I was researching for our show today. You know, I, I learned that I think we went consolidated back in maybe the late 60s, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, 1968. Mm -hmm. And there was a real push from what I understand, and feel free to, to clue me in here, but there was a real push to potentially have more consolidated governments than that. I think it was on the ballot for Tampa and it didn't go through and a couple other major cities. Right. But I think there's only maybe maybe 10 major cities out there now. Not that... many, yeah. And, and I don't think you're going to see that change because when, when you consolidate, you're asking uh, elected officials to give up power. The only reason it works here, and I think it's probably true in most places, is we were um, in a, a state of disaster. We had our schools were disaccredited. We're, they were hauling elected officials to jail every day, being indicted for fraud and corruption. Uh, we were literally dumping raw sewage into the river. There were a lot of bad things happening. And I think that the citizenry led by our local paper, the Times Union, um, basically revolted. And, and, and they created an atmosphere. They said, look, we need to, we need to stop doing everything we've been, we've been doing and, and reimagine how we govern ourselves. Uh, and that was, uh, so it really does take a crisis to cause people to uh, uh, embrace a seismic shift in governance. So I don't think you'll see it uh, in many places. Uh, but I will tell you, our form of government is the envy of, I think, any city in America. Um, having a strong mayor uh, that is one voice, one call, you know, if you need to do a deal, if you need to get something shaken, uh, shaken up or shaken loose, whatever it may be, um, it, it makes a huge difference. And, and you really can't discount that, particularly as you look at, we compete economically with a lot of regions in the Southeast. Um, the bureaucracy that you go through uh, in other regions, when you got to get the set, the county on the same board with the city, and who's going to pay the incentives, and 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 what, who's going to be the true beneficiary, and arguing over who the true beneficiary is, um, you know, a lot of a lot of cities argue over where the convention center goes. Uh, so we don't have that here. Um, and, and in addition to the low tax burden, it's just a very efficient uh, way to govern, and it, it and that does parlay into having a more competitive economy. Could we talk a little bit more about um, maybe some of the the other effects of a consolidated government, specifically about downtown Jacksonville? It's something that, you know, right. JWB is making a lot of news with our investments. There's a lot of really positive momentum for downtown. Right. Uh, can you talk about maybe how downtown, you know, why it's taken so long for downtown right. to, uh, you know, right. fulfill our potential and maybe how consolidated government kind of led to that? Yeah. So I, I would say this. I think, you know, when you look at downtown Jacksonville, you, you are kind of taken aback by why why hasn't it moved forward as fast as other downtowns around the region? And, and as mayor, um, I was very frustrated by this reality. And we spent a lot of time studying um, different communities and what they did that really mobilized their city. I would say if there's if there is one downside to consolidation, and it's not perfect, but I, I think there are far more benefits than than, than liabilities, um, is that downtown um, kind of lost its voice. Um, you know, we had tremendous growth in the suburbs, um, and, and they had a lot of needs in these suburbs. Um, you had folks leaving downtown, uh, no one was living downtown, and we had a lot of jobs leaving downtown too. They went to the south side. So um, there really wasn't, there wasn't the advocacy that you would have in other parts of the town. So as you're competing for resources when you're assembling the, the, the city budget, the county budget, um, downtown often would get um, uh, sidetracked. Uh, having said that, we are a strong mayor form of government, and almost every mayor since consolidation has been deeply committed to downtown, and we have seen significant capital investment. Uh, we have one of the most beautiful libraries in Southeast. It's a new uh, uh, Robert Stern design building. Um, we've got a great arena, um, uh, a, a nice ballpark, um, a, a great stadium for the NFL. Um, so, you know, we have river walks on both North and South Bank uh, downtown. So I think we have been able to invest uh, with some what I would call signature projects through uh, very ambitious visions that various mayors have had through time. And every mayor has kind of done their part um, to try to bring it along. And when I was in office, we redid Laura Street um, to the tune of a million dollars a block. We completely redid the street with the streetscape. And, um, and, and you know, re reinvigorated the fountain, the Friendship Fountain on South Bank, and we completely replaced the uh, South Bank Riverwalk that was wood and now it's concrete. So, mm -hmm. so we have been able to make, I'd say, project-based um, improvement or, or progress. Um, but I think we do have some 
uh, governance issues around downtown, we really need to talk about, um, it'd be nice if we had a downtown um, governance structure that had independent funding and could really embrace a long range vision that could carry yeah. us through time. And, and I think, you know, we'll see that over time, but yeah, Jacksonville has, downtown has lagged, but I, from all indications from what I see, and, and you guys would know firsthand, um, we are seeing a resurgence in activity. Uh, if you just look at the number of housing units that have been added just in the past few years and the ones that are on the on the docket to be built, um, it's truly impressive. Brooklyn is on yeah. fire. Um, you got a lot of housing on the South Bank. Um, you've got a lot of, uh, what I'd say, pockets of success in the urban mm -hmm. core. Um, so I'm more encouraged than I've ever been. Um, our goal has always to be have, it has always been to have 10,000 units downtown. Mm -hmm. um, and we are steadily approaching that because we think once you get to 10,000 units, then the dynamics start to change. You see a little more street life, the dry cleaner can stay in business, maybe the coffee shop, the sandwich shop, uh, perhaps a, a grocer. You know, these folks can then have the viability of having folks around them uh, to keep business going. You know, and I mean, it seems like all along the way with all of the mayors and seeing the projects that have been completed, the mayors really have, have gotten downtown, right? They, they right. see the opportunity there. Right. It seems a little bit of a struggle, you know, when you have a city council, which we have, which is 19 city council members, um, and there's not, there's not an advocate for downtown out of right. those, those city council members. So I know it's been a little bit of a struggle, but right. would you, you know, and then the downtown investment authority, would you say that that has been a big kind of, you know, I guess a big voice for downtown. Has that been basically something that has kind yeah. of been an advocate that we have been missing in the past? Well, there's, there's always been some form of it. Um, you've had the downtown, um, uh, it's had different names through time, um, but now it's the downtown investment um, uh, group. But, uh, but I, I think um, really what would help, really what we should do is consider an independent funding source uh, with, with longer term uh, board service, so they can really make decisions outside the political arena um, and, and, and really have the discipline to stick to a master plan. Um, we have term limits here, uh, which you know, has a tendency to uh, make long range planning somewhat difficult. So uh, I think you know, a, a dedicated funding source, kind of like other independent authorities like the Port Authority or the Jacksonville Transportation Authority, or even the Jacksonville Electric Authority, um, if you had that funding source and you had board members that really could make the best long-term decisions over time. I think that would be a structural change that would uh, that would really help. But you're asking uh, city council to relinquish, uh, you know, some control, and that's always a tough sell. Interesting. You br you bring up a lot of. It seems like there's just been a lot of iterations of history and changes and and how it's sold, right? And I think about when I first started coming to Jacksonville was when I was at University of Florida, come from Florida Georgia weekend, mm -hmm. was 99 to 2003, right around the beginning of your term, and and how profoundly different the city feels yes. uh, these days, right? And then I think, you know, as mayor, your job is to a large extent to sell the city to 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 outsiders and investors and and, and to people on board, and then as head of the 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 board of the chamber, it's kind of the mm -hmm. same. How has that message evolved, right? Because I, I hear, I very consistently hear now, low tax base, um, right. thriving economic environment, mm -hmm. high quality of life. Has, right. has it has it always has the pitch always been similar, and it just continues to 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 build into itself, or has the I pitch think, changed yeah, over think, time? I think what we're seeing now is is the competition really for talent, um, and I think what you're seeing is that that's really top of mind for both most folks that are looking. Um, and the good news is we're well positioned for that. Being the youngest city in Florida, having the military here, you know, they're pumping out thousands of uh, qualified um, workers every year from, um, uh, from their facilities. Um, and, and we've got a great track record, both in healthcare and financial services. So I think uh, we can compete there. And we have, we have uh, excellent um, educational institutions here that are, are great at uh, collaborating and uh, really trying to envision how uh, their programs, um, how their curriculum can really benefit a particular company that has a particular skill set that they, they, they need to make their, their uh, investment work. So um, I, I think, you know, all of those things are important. You know, it's interesting. I've been through this process of recruiting businesses for a long time. I did it as mayor for eight years and of course with the chamber the past few years. Um, my experience is, is, is always very similar with everyone we recruit. Initially, people do not understand Jacksonville. They don't know it. It is an unknown. And with that unknown comes a certain amount of fear and anxiety. Um, but as people get to know our community, 
um, they then start to embrace you know, the, the, the positive assets we have here. But once they come here, um, what I've observed time and time again is almost everyone that is a part of that decision-making process comes back to us and says it was the best decision we ever made. Um, our, our workers are happy here. They have a great quality of life here. Our housing costs are very affordable compared to other places in, in the country. Um, and, and they're very pleased with the talent that's available uh, so they can be competitive in the workforce. So uh, it, it, it's, it, in fact, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen where folks, in order to grow in these respective companies, they had to leave the market, you know, to go to, to assume more responsibility. And they would choose to leave their company and keep their family in Jacksonville versus uh, moving up in their company and being transferred. Um, you know, the joke is once you get them here, you cannot pry them out of here with a crowbar. They do right. not want to leave and they love the quality of life and the, and the way they live here. So um, I, I think our biggest challenge is uh, demystifying a place that is relatively unknown. And, and, and that was our challenge during the Super Bowl uh, when we, we, in 2005, you know, how do we really use that event to really uh, kind of educate people on where we are and who we are? Um, and I think that that challenge continues. Um, I think it becomes very obvious to the folks that do a deep dive and they study our community. Um, for those that don't, um, you know, they, they, they take the safer path and, and they go to the markets that are more familiar to them. John, can I can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, you were you were 38 when you became mayor, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really, really, I'm about to be 38 in a month. I can't imagine being <laughs> mayor of a major. Join the energy. Like <laughs> I had a lot of energy back then. I mean, and you are you have always been an incredibly successful guy. I mean, being a mayor is high profile, high stress, and and a whole different world of challenges than running a incredibly successful company. You know what made you? make that choice? I mean, what, what drove you to become mayor at such a young age and take on such a challenge? And um, what, what was it for you? Yeah, I, um, I always had an interest in public service. Um, and it started, and as corny as this sound, it started in college. I was student body president. I was president of my fraternity. Um, and then I left college and went to DC and worked for um, Senator Bob Graham of Florida, who was the previous governor, a very popular governor and senator of our, our state. Um, and was really inspired by him. He was um, just a great mentor. Uh, and I just, it became obvious the difference you can make uh, when you're in the public sector. Um, listen, you can, you can make a lot of change with being in the private sector, no doubt. You can contribute to elected officials and, 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 and you can help them as best you can to, to advance your community. Um, but we should never discount um, the impact you can have in public office. Um, we make decisions every day um, collectively at City Hall um, that really shape who we become as a community. Um, and and I, I would argue that uh, you have a better advantage of making a difference at the local level than you ever could at state or federal level. Um, the budget is very transparent, where the money goes, where it's spent. You can see the work. You're always accountable. Uh, you go to the grocery store as mayor, you're, you're accountable. You know, if somebody sees something you don't like, they'll tell you in the grocery store. So I think that's good. I mean, I don't think you have that with state and federal as much. I mean, these, these elected leaders, you know, they, they go out of town and no one really knows where the money goes. And um, here that they know. And, and, and I've found too, that if you have a vision and you share it with your community, most people will buy into it, even if it may cost a little more, um, if they can, they can see what the options are um, and, and they have full transparency, um, people will go along. They like being led. They like taking a little risk. And um, and that, that part was very rewarding for me. So I, I just, you know, I, I, I think it's important that anyone in business or anyone who is engaged in their community, uh, who is in office matters, who we elect matters. And, 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 and we are managing our limited resources. In Jacksonville, the, the general fund is over a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. And, 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 that, and how we spend that money, where it goes, and how we change lives with it. Um, is, is, is very challenging. You know, we have limited resources. We're competing those dollars um, for everything we do. Um, and so I, I found it to be a great, great job. Um, it's a hard job. Uh, it, you, you, if, if, you're, if you have an interest in being liked, or if that's your goal in life is to be liked, you, you do not want to be in public office. <laughs> because the truth, the truth matters, a lot of things that need to be done are not politically expedient. Um, and, and there's, you know, shared pain a lot of times. Um, we can't print money in Jacksonville like they do in the federal government. They just, they print money and try to keep everybody happy. We have to make hard decisions and, and someone's usually upset about that. And um, so, you know, is, is there's conflict and there's debate and there's 
uh, discourse. But um, but listen, it was a great experience um, because this is a great city and we have a great form of government. I don't think I would have run for mayor uh, in any other format um, other than what we have. The mayor here is the CEO and everyone in the government works for the mayor. And, the mayor has um, a staff, and and, and it, it's 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 you know the mayor doesn't go to the city council meetings um, except once a year to present the budget. So you're, it's a management job, and that's what appealed to me was it's a true management job the way we have it structured. Uh, so for me, it was a great experience, and and I'm glad I did it. I was also glad it was over because uh, you know it's it's hard, it's, it's very demanding, well, and uh, I mean you um, had more challenges than most as mayor. I mean, first of all, thank you for your service because this is when I think about your run as mayor um it truly to me seems like you just love the city right you are jacksonville through and through and that's why you did it can't always say that for other folks who who take right. you know those offices in other cities and whatnot so thank you for your service but then i mean talk about challenges right you were mayor from 2003 to 2011 right right mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. nothing happened yeah. in the real estate market during yeah. your term yeah it was a, it was a tough time we had several compounding challenges uh that of course you never could have anticipated when i was running but um, we had a governor in Charlie Chris that actually rolled back the property rates um, for all the counties. A pretty, pretty clever gimmick on his part. He, he said he's going to drop taxes like a rock. He didn't cut his taxes at the state. He cut county taxes, um, mm -hmm. which hurt Jacksonville because we've been good stewards. We've been rolling back the military rate for 14 years. We'd had enough growth in the tax base that we we're able actually to roll back the rate. Um, and, and I was part of that. I did rollbacks in, in early part of my term. So we had we had the state took our property tax rates down. We've been good stewards. Our pension costs were rising. We had a pension crisis that was uh, starting to show uh, uh, dangerous signs. And then on top of that, the recession hit, and, and property values dropped and, and tax revenue dropped. So uh, we were in a, a, a true state of crisis, and and uh, uh, and it came it came really obvious to us that we we're going to have to do something that most politicians don't ever want to do and, um, and, and try to avoid, and that is raise revenue in the middle of a recession where unemployment was high. Um, the other option to that was uh, we really start uh, significantly reducing services, um, including uh, mowing uh, you know, on a regular basis, uh, uh, public safety, libraries, shuttering. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got to the point, I said, look, I, I was born here. I'm living here. I did not take this office to watch this place get dismantled or to watch us diminish this community. Um, if we all pay a little bit more, um, we can we can get through this. And, and and people think of a tax increase; they just they have a visceral reaction to you know the, the government taking all their money. You know, basically, we say, look, for the cost of a Starbucks, you know, like once a week, you know, minimal increases to the average homeowner. Collectively, that money will make a difference, and we can restore our quality of life and, and not not really diminish this place. And um, I gave that budget presentation 60 times around our community to anyone that would listen, um, and we were able to pass um, two millage increase, two millage increases, um, and we passed three fees. We never had a fee in Jacksonville. We passed three fees: uh, franchise fee, stormwater fee, uh, and the garbage fee. Um, never thought I would be happier, proud of that. But I will tell you, in absence of that funding, we would have devastated this region. Um, and uh, we didn't really have a choice. And, and so uh, we raised uh, nearly $100 million on a billion dollar budget. So it was, it was real money. That we, and, the, and by the way, this is reoccurring revenue. We, we benefit from that to this day. Um, and so mm -hmm. we, we, we didn't diminish the place and we were able to keep um, you know, status quo, which was our goal. We weren't gonna be able to increase service, but we we're gonna be able to hold status quo. Um, and we did that. And, and I think many mayors have benefited over time from that. But I will tell you, those decisions would keep me from getting reelected. That's how unpopular they are. I was reelected with 80%. Uh, my approval rating when I left office, probably around 50%. People do not want to pay more taxes. Um, and, and I get it. No one wants to. But sometimes you have to do what, what, what you have to do. And uh, it's not very popular. That's real leadership right there. And to, make a, to go on to a point you made earlier about the property taxes being low here in this region, you know, the stormwater fees and things of that right. nature. We, you know, for our investors, we lump those in as property taxes, the same right. net effect. And, right. and our taxes are still lower than other. Still low. Market yeah. And listen, so. even after that, even after that, if you compare us to any metropolitan area we compete with or any other city in Florida, we're still freakishly low. So, you know, we're still the basement bargain, uh, even though we added a little revenue. And, and by the way, you know, we probably need to add a little bit more, you know, at some point, but gradually over time, uh, just because it's the right, you know, mm -hmm. Government is like business. You know, the number one cause of failure in business is undercapitalization. And I think the very same thing can be said for cities. You need to invest in them. And this is a good investment. This is where we live, right? This is where we live. We raise our families. We work. Um, why wouldn't we want to invest in the place where we spend our time and, and raise our families 
Um, it, and I think there's a case to be made, uh, but, but the voters want to hear the case. They don't want to be surprised. They want to know what they're going to get for it. And that just requires transparency and open communication, constant dialogue, um, which is important. And, and it should be ongoing, an ongoing dialogue of where are we trying to go? What is it going to take to get there? And you said, I mean, unbelievable perspective here, right? Like, and, and you have this very, very unique perspective of being a top executive of a city and a top executive of a, of a giant corporation. And I see now the answer to all this not raising taxes and whatever, it seems to be the public-private partnership, which is, which is becoming a more and more prevalent thing. And from, from your stories that you're telling of having a consolidated government and, and having these things, it seems like there would be an advantage in doing public-private partnerships and projects like that. Can you give us a little bit about your thoughts on the public-private partnership as a tool and, and, and where you see that heading for this region, if, if you're a fan of it? or Right. Yeah, I, think, I think there are opportunities. So, so if you have someone that wants to invest in, let's say, in a property downtown, um, their investment in that property is going to increase the tax base, right? And, and I think it's okay to share in that value that is created, the value proposition. It's okay for the taxpayer to share in that value proposition um, if, if the property is going to be improved and the taxpayer is going to benefit over the long haul on this, this increased investment base. So, um, and I think because of the way we're structured, we're able to do that really painlessly. Um, and by saying, look, if you're willing to make the, the capital investment here, we know the property tax rate is going to go up. And we're, we're willing to share in that, you know, um, and, and give, it, give back a portion of that uh, to reward you for the risk you're taking. Um, and I think that's fine. And, and you see that a lot. You see, um, you see that uh, done. And, 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 and I think it's done without a lot of bureaucracy, you know, and, and uh, uh, because you can have the one-on-one -on -one conversations here um, with the people that make the decisions that are going to take it to city council for approval. You can call the city council member and say, this is what we're doing. I think most people have been pretty receptive. Um, there has not been a lot of pushback on incentive pay um, for companies to come here or, or, or any kind of tax increment financing. Um, there's been receptivity to that. I think because there is a belief that downtown is everyone's neighborhood. It is our gathering place. It is our identity. Um, and after all, you can't be a suburb of nothing, right? You want to have a, an urban core um, where you enjoy coming together. We come, we get there. We go there for fireworks. A lot of people go there to, to worship. We certainly go there for sports. We go there for Broadway plays, symphonies. It is our it is our gathering spot, and 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 um, and, and so it's in our best interest to invest in this place that already has infrastructure, it already has roads, it has fire stations, it has schools, it has libraries, it's all there. We don't need to recreate it in the suburbs like we do. It's very expensive. It's all there. So it's in the taxpayer's interest to really assist in the risk takers and say, look, it's a good business model <laughs> if this area does well, because everything you need to support community is already there. Let's just bring everyone back and enjoy it and create a community. I love it. I love it. I'm, 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 I'm a fan of the model myself. Yeah. Um, and if I can get a little selfish asking you something real quick, and then we've got a couple of questions from the audience that we're yeah. going to ask as well. But I read that when you, when you gave up, when you finished your term as mayor and you went back to being president of, 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 of Gate, mm -hmm. that your COO at the time was mm -hmm. a gentleman that started as a gas station attendant and right. grew all the way to be COO. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if in today's environment, where how Jacksonville is recruiting talent and and the, and the way that it's coming, how different that would be, right? Like is 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 nowadays nowadays a company of your size and your ilk having a COO that is so homegrown versus being able to bring it from the outside, and 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 I wonder your perspective on recruiting executives and recruiting yeah. you know the talent itself as opposed to so, just the company. Right. So we have we operate in four different divisions, and you're really speaking of the retail division where. where convenience stores and service stations and car washes. Um, and, and so in, in this company, your best chance of management is starting out from the bottom. Um, we're not looking for um, in a, the, the degree you bring to the job. We're looking for honesty. We're looking for hard work ethic and ability to get along with others uh, and provide leadership. And if you, dim, if you demonstrate those traits, there's a very clear a career path. Um, and you usually start out in third shift you can go shift leader, you can go team leader, you can go to assistant manager, you can go to manager, you can go to supervisor, division manager. And, and, and there are a lot of opportunities in different directions as you move up the ladder. So um, that's kind of our culture. Um, and that's, you know, this, this company started with one service station in one of the worst areas of town um, as far as crime goes. So um, that, that is embedded here. And I would say in our precast business, um, we do a lot of architectural and, and, and structural precast for large uh, commercial structures. 
um, very much the same. Now, there are specialty offerings. If you need someone with IT or you need someone with finance, you know, there are certain um, specialty items in this office that we, we recruit for. Um, but we're very proud that, you know, a lot of folks, you know, I started out in the service station business. I was pumping gas, you know, when I was in high school. Um, we didn't have convenience stores much back then. We had mainly just service stations and they pull up and provide full service gas and check the oil and clean the restrooms and all that. So it, it's, it, it's who we are. And, and, and that, I think it keeps us humble. It keeps us on path and, um, and, and we, we grow at a very steady rate. We don't have explosive growth. It's, we, we grow organically, usually not by acquisition in the retail division. Um, so it's, uh, you know, we're proud of our culture and our challenge as we grow is to make sure we don't lose that. You know, John, I, I'd just love to kind of get inside your head a little bit and just, you know, somebody who has experienced so many forms of accomplishment and, and you're running this incredible company. Would, how many, how many employees do you have right now, John? Uh, about 4,000. Yeah. About 4,000 4, employees. And, and you saw this thing start from the ground up. I mean, what do you, what do you, so with JWB, we have about 80 employees now. And mm -hmm. I, I, I think I'm just so proud of the, the talent that we have. We're nowhere near the size company that you could be. What, what do you see when you look at your team today? What fires you up the most about Gate? You know, it's, um, it is our culture, uh, as I was mentioning. Um, this company, for as large as, as it is, it has a, a very family-oriented culture. Um, and, and I think it starts from the very top. It starts with my father, uh, who started this business in 1960, um, and it carries on to this day. And, and uh, we treat each other well. Uh, we treat the people we do business well. Um, we treat our vendors well. There's, it's a respectful environment. Um, and, and, and if you perform well, and if you're hardworking and you're honest, you'll do well here. Uh, if you are not honest, you will not do well here. <laughs> and we have zero tolerance for that. Um, so, um, but I, I think, um, you know, I, I enjoy the people of this company. I mean, I really do. I, that's, I, I feel so fortunate. You know, City Hall is a, is a, is a, is a tough environment because you have so many people running in different directions. Your, your legislative branch, they all have their own agendas. A lot of the uh, civil service type employees are just trying to wait you out. You know, uh, they've been there forever and they're going to be there after you go. Um, in at Gate, we're all pulling the same direction. And that's the beauty of a, of a private company. And, and uh, uh, we, we, we work well together and, and, and we make decisions based on the facts. Um, City Hall is sometimes that uh, doesn't happen. You know, it's a, uh, it's, a lot of decisions have to be more political than merit based. Uh, so uh, it, it's it. it I would say we just, we've got good, good, good people. And, and, and more important than any skill set you bring here is that you fit. Uh, and if you don't fit with our culture, that's what's, that's what's going to end your career. It's not going to be how good you are at your job. It's whether you fit in this, this culture. And because perpetuating the way we, the way we do business is the most important part. Cause I think this is what, what makes us unique. That's why we have very little turnover. Um, and, and why it's very, very common to see someone who's been here 25, 30, 40 years. Jordan. Incredible to hear. It's, uh, it's just refreshing to see somebody who's so many light years ahead and saying the same things that I say about my team and the reasons right. why I love what I do. So appreciate you. Good. Yeah, man, this, this is extraordinary. I'm like, I'm completely geeking out at the parallels of, you know, operational prowess and vision and values and culture and all this stuff. I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, John, if you don't mind, we're, we're going to have some user generated questions sure. here that we'll sure. ask you and answer it to the best of your abilities, right? We just sure. like to include our, include our viewers here on the show. Rob Jones asks, do you have a homeless problem in Jacksonville? And if not, what are you doing differently than cities like LA and San Francisco, et cetera? Yeah, we do. Home, we have a homeless problem. And I, and I think every city in America has a homeless problem. And I don't think any city in America has, has solved it. Um, it is, it is hard. I, I wrestled with it when I was mayor. Um, I think the current mayor struggles with it. Um, a lot of our issues around homelessness are mental illness, um, and I think uh, we, we do not invest, uh, society does not invest enough. A lot of our homelessness uh, are veterans, and uh, are, 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 a lot of our homeless people are veterans. So um, we, we have um, some fantastic um, providers, um, Salzbacher Center and others that um, do as good a job as anyone in the business and, and, and the city does a good job of supporting their mission and others um, that, that support that. Um, I know we've worked hard on transitional housing. Uh, we've tried to focus on day shelters, um, but it is, you know, my experience that it is a mental health problem more than anything and, 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 uh, um, and getting help and treatment and, and, and hopefully not allowing your jail to be the mental health solution 
is the challenge for Jackson One and every other community. Um, I think uh, as I move, I move around the Southeast uh, with my work and, and uh, so I see other downtown environments. Um, I have been in other cities that will go unnamed where I really thought I was on the scene of a zombie movie. Um, it was, uh, I, I was stunned at, at the homeless situation and the, and the, and the rampant drug use um, in broad daylight um, of, of folks on the streets. Um, we don't have it that way here. Um, it is not that bad here. Um, I think um, our relative to other cities, um, I think we do a better job uh, of managing it than others, but it is still a problem. And, 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 um, and, and, and again, there's, I found no silver bullet. Um, we, we tried different things along the way, um, and, and we tried to support those, those caretakers that do a good job. Um, but yes, there is, there's a homeless problem here, just like there is in every other city in America. So your, your response definitely reflects a level of empathy of a great leader, right? Like I'm, as, a, as, a, as a resident here, I, I, I thought maybe where you're going to say it, there wasn't, it, it doesn't feel very palpable, right? But like, right. I, as, right. as you say, right, anybody being homeless is a problem and, right. and we need to address You know, it's that. interesting. I, 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 one, one thing I've noticed downtown and someone kind of shed light on this to me, um, I, I lived in DC for a while and, and, and you know, I would, I would see homelessness everywhere. And I, I, a lot of times you'd have encounters with homelessness um, and some of it was not very positive. Um, but in DC, you were surrounded by so many people when you're walking down the street, it, it didn't really phase you as much. I think downtown, when you see a homeless person in downtown Jacksonville, because there's, there's not a lot of street life, there's not a lot of pedestrian traffic, it really stands out and it becomes almost a personal engagement um, uh, more than you would feel it in a, in a metropolitan area where you have a lot of foot traffic, and a lot of uh, street life. And so um, I think sometimes uh, people see it as being bigger than it is because that's sometimes all you see as opposed to a city that has a lot of street life where it's all blended in. Um, but it's, uh, but yeah, it's, it, listen, there's no denying it. It's a problem. Um, and, and, uh, but I think relative to other cities, um, we manage it better than, um, and, and I'm saying that without any facts or statistics, I'm, I'm just, from what I see as I move around um, to other cities around the Southeast, um, I, I think it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent here as I've seen it in other cities. That's very well articul articulated. Um, Lee Bishop asks, health of industry enables growth of city, right? With one central leadership for city and county, I would think a renewed growth of industry would increase spending in the city. Is the spending consolidated or is it separate and needs tax benefits for industrial growth? Okay, so I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, the question is, are we spending, spending where? Spending in, in job recruitment or downtown investment or what? what? I'm just okay. trying to understand. Yeah, you know, I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure Lee will, Lee will chime back in. He's a very engaged uh, member of our audience. Spending in the city revitalization. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. So I would say m most of our spending has been uh, project-based. Um, and and so um, it's interesting. I was with the mayor last week, and I, uh, before my meeting with him, I, I, I drove around downtown just taking pictures because there's a lot going on downtown. We've, um, we've uh, eliminated the Jacksonville Landing. Um, uh, which is a beautiful green space now. It, 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 it's, it's a phenomenal front yard to downtown at this point. It was a, a retail center that was unsuccessful. Um, we, we're taking down the overhead, the, the, the above ground ramp off the Hart Bridge, which was kind of an obstacle between the, the, the land we want to develop in the river. Um, and uh, uh, so you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of capital investment between the, 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 the acquiring land and demolishing buildings that need to come down moving roadways, taking those down. Um, and then historically, the new arena, the new ballpark, uh, the new library, um, you're seeing a lot, but it's, it's project-based as we go, um, I, I, I would say, and, and, and it has been pretty significant over time. Makes sense. Last question here, uh, Guillermo Montes asks, what are the great opportunity areas in Jacksonville for the next five to 10 years? And he asks aerospace with a question mark. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we have this amazing um, uh, retired Navy base um, uh, out west of town. It was called Cecil Air, 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 Airstrip. Um, and um, we have uh, taken that property, thousands of acres, and redeployed that uh, into industrial uh, use. Um, but those long runways, 
but they're so long they're actually a backup for the for the space shuttle when we had the space shuttle. Um, but there, I think we have a great opportunity there. Um, we've got the land, we've got the runways, we've got um, we've got the military presence here um, to support those kind of technical jobs. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, we are really a huge logistics center, and I haven't really touched on that. But between the port, um, we have three interstates coming through here. We have multiple rail uh, 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 providers coming through here. Uh, not to mention, you know, within a you know eight hour drive, um, you reach a lot of folks from Jacksonville and you're in the middle of where the growth is, right? The Sunbelt where everyone's kind of migrating um, right there at the end of I-10, 95 and then to the west, I-75. So uh, I think we're gonna continue to see great logistical advantages and you've seen huge investments with distribution centers here, leveraging all those um, assets. Um, so I, I think that that's huge. Um, I think downtown core revitalization will continue and it's gonna, it's gonna continue to faster rate. I think post virus downtowns will continue to be um, uh, important and vibrant uh, opportunities for living. Um, we're going to continue to play to our strengths. Healthcare is a huge strength. We got Mayo Clinic here. They recruit patients from all over the world. We got um, UF Health, the protein, proton um, beam here. Um, they recruit patients from all over the world. You got Nemours Children's Clinic, one of the finest leading children's clinics in the country. Uh, combined with the regional network of hospitals, which are amazing providers, um, healthcare will continue. One out of six people in this area work in healthcare through either healthcare providing or through insurance. Um, so you're going to continue to see growth there. Financial services have had huge success here. So you'll continue to see growth there um, and all that comes with it. So I, I think, you know, and, and it's nice, it's a, it's a portfolio that's diversified and should survive time as opposed to communities that have all their eggs in one basket, which is often the case. It is exciting to be a part of this community. It is exciting to have been a part of this conversation. Really just really, really enjoyed your insight, John. I, I, I wanna you know, kind of encourage everybody to give this thing a listen again, right? Like I, I think there was a lot of insight in, in where our community is growing. And if you're thinking about uh, what market you're investing in and, and, and you know, like all things equal, we preach here that that the appreciation of Jacksonville that's coming and, and, and the community around it is is kind of what what differentiates um, the investment. I think it's obvious with leaders like yourself that this is a great place to invest. It's a great place to raise a family. Um, and I want to encourage any, anybody with us that that wants more on the, on the X's and O's of rental property investing to go to jwbwebclass.com, download that free toolkit, join us on Thursdays at the same time. We have a Q and A where we break down a property. And, uh, and answer you know, more questions from the audience as well. And John, I just wanna really thank you for being a part of this conversation. I, I find it incredibly enlightening. And as a, as a new resident, I'm super, super pumped to, to grow here. And I, and I kind of leave it up to Greg here to, to give the, 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 the final goodbyes here. Yeah, well, let me just say, as Greg comes on, um, JWB has, has been a pioneer in, in, in Jacksonville and in downtown. And um, I, I, for one, as a resident, appreciate what you're doing. Um, there's a little risk taking involved, but um, high risk, high yield, right? And, and I think you all are making some smart bets. Um, and I get very excited when I pick up the business journal and, and see all you're doing. And um, I love tracking the, the, the projects and, and the enthusiasm. I see Alex around. Um, you all are doing a great job. And, and, and we're just, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're choosing Jacksonville as a place to, to grow your business. Well, thank you, John. You know, I tell Alex all the time, I'm trying to push him to be the next uh, John Payne to be mayor, but you know, I don't think he's, I don't think he's up for, up for the position yet. <laughs> he's having, I think he's having too much fun where he is. <laughs> yeah. thank, you. thank you for, uh, for being here with us. I mean, just an incredibly enlightening conversation. Thank you for being such a great leader to Jacksonville. Um, and from, from a business perspective as well, it's inspiring to know that you can lead such an incredible organization, still hold true to your values. And, um, and you've done a lot for Jacksonville and for me personally. So I appreciate you being here and, and being such a great inspiration. Well, listen, Greg, Pablo, thank you both. You've been great and um, love this place. It's obviously you do too. And, and appreciate all y'all do. And, and uh, for all of your viewers that are tuned in, I, I hope you'll take a deep dive into Jacksonville. Really uh, take the time to learn more about this community. There's a lot here, a lot that's not really understood or known, which to me spells opportunity. And I and, uh, hope, hope, hope your folks will take a look. I, I got nothing better to say than that. I hope to see you all on Thursday. Good. Thanks Excellent. again. Take care. All right, take care. Thank you, John.